Okay, looks like we're going. So uh, thank you guys for joining us. This is our middle school parent information meeting. And the reason that we are holding this meeting is to kind of give you some information as far as getting our middle schoolers back on campus. Uh, for those of you who have been attending these meetings for the past eight months or so, you know that has been our goal. Um, I'm assuming that many of you got my message from this weekend that talked about a slight delay in that return. Um, I am equally disappointed with that. I know most of you are, at least my conversations with you, with you have reflected that. Um, we'll talk to you a little bit about why that decision was made. Um, and tonight, try to give you some information as far as where we've been with this, where we're at now and where we're going, um, the health uh, mitigations that we're putting into play uh, to keep kids safe while they're here at school, and also to um, go into the academic program and what the academic program options are for you. So uh, we're scheduled to go for about an hour. Like I said, our goal is to answer any questions that we can for you. And uh, whatever we get to can't, can't get to today, uh, we'll be happy to follow up with you. So uh, we are gonna start out a little bit. Um, like I said, thank you for joining us. Um, we want to get a feel for, like I said, where we've been, where we're going. And the purpose of this one isn't to try to convince you one way or the other. Um, I know we sent out a survey a while back as far as your uh, preference, and we have the results of that. Um, but at the time, the uh, model of the program wasn't real well defined, and we've uh, got a better indication as to where that's going. So if you do change your mind or have not yet responded to the survey, um, we'd ask that you do that um, by the end of this week so that we can start making plans as to exactly how this will roll out, because some of our plans are contingent upon the number of students choosing on campus learning versus, versus our virtual learning. Um, to give you a little review of where we've been, um, we have uh, created a return to school plan that uh, prioritizes safety, but looks to bring kids back um, as quickly as possible uh, in the areas of highest need. And so beginning of September, we got some permission to start bringing kids back to campus. When we started the school year, um, all students were required by law to be virtual learners. And early part of September, we got permission to start bringing some kids back. And so we started with kids that were on IEPs, um, students with disabilities and our English learners. And we've had uh, small groups of those students on campus since the early part of September. Um, about a month ago, we brought back our TK, kinder and first graders, um, followed by our second and third graders about three weeks ago. And just this past week, we brought our fourth and fifth graders back. Um, as you guys know, we had planned to bring middle schoolers back on the 3rd of November, which would have been a week from today. Uh, that date has been uh, delayed until the 30th of November, which is the week after Thanksgiving break. And a lot of that has to do with some of the um, academic changes that we made um, uh, to support some safety among our students and staff. So we'll go into what those changes are and, and why that pushed us back a little bit. Um, but before we start out, we'll go into some safety protocols. Uh, if you guys have attended any of these other parent sessions for our primary or elementary uh, students, um, a lot of the safety stuff will sound familiar. Uh, the academic stuff will be different though. We've got some uh, big cha uh, significant changes between the elementary program and, and the middle school program. Um, when we look at our safe return to school plan, uh, we emphasize four main things and we'll kind of go into how those apply or how those will apply to your kids. Um, and those four main things are, are screening. Uh, the second is uh, distancing and cohorting, uh, use of physical barriers in the classroom. The third is uh, masking, uh, uh, facial coverings. And the uh, fourth one is our sanitation and ventilation efforts. So we'll take those kind of in turn. Um, the screening, uh, if you have been to school in the morning, uh, drop off looks a whole lot different. Um, we do screen every staff member and every student who comes on campus. Uh, we do ask them questions about symptoms, about exposure, about medications. Um, but what we do before then is ask you if you have kids that have symptoms, if your kids are sick, keep them home. Um, we wanna make sure that we keep our school environment safe, not only for our students and our staff, but to allow our instructional programs to go forth. Um, there's been some schools that have opened up recently that have had some challenges and right after they open up, they close down. Uh, 
we don't begrudge them for their safety efforts, but we'd like to take every effort we can to make sure people are safe and we don't have to do that. Um, our drop-off procedures for middle school, um, we'll, we will encourage middle schoolers to use the west parking lot, which is over by the preschool area to do your morning drop-offs and screens. Um, you do have the ability to use the main lot or the east lot, which is the kinder lot as well. All three will be available for you, but in order to space folks out, we're encouraging the west lot use um, for our middle school students. And obviously if you have multiple students uh, in different grades, go wherever you want. Um, that part of that health screen includes both temp those questions and a temperature screen. Um, students with 100 degree or more temperature are not admitted uh, to school. Um, we recommend that those students stay with you in the car until the screening is complete, um, because if they do not pass that screening, they are going to go with you. Um, so we have you, the students stay in the car and not be dropped off at school. Uh, the way the process works is we do ask when you come up that everyone in the car uh, be wearing uh, a facial covering, that the student be unbuckled, that the windows get rolled down, and then we get ready to check and have all the backpack and everything ready to go. Um, we've found that we've established a pretty efficient process and we're able to get all kids uh, in the door and into class by 8.30 um, arrival time. Suggested arrival time is 8.10. Uh, we do start screening students at 8.10. We don't open the gates until 8.15. Uh, the reason the gates open a little later than they had in the past is students are not permitted to head down to the playground area. Uh, we do keep students in cohorted groups, uh, essentially their class section throughout the day, so that once they arrive on campus, we make some efforts to keep them distance from one another and head directly to their classroom. Uh, another reason that middle school <clears throat> would be best dropped off at the West Gate is it's close to most of their homeroom. If a student does fail the temperature screen, like I said, they do, uh, they are not permitted to come to campus and they're typically out for uh, 10 days. Um, the teacher will provide some work and there's some afternoon support. We'll get into this in the instructional program in just a moment. Um, there are some other ways to have students come back. Um, they could come back with a negative COVID test and symptom free for three days. And you may also get a note from your doctor that talks about a, a chronic condition for the symptoms. So if your student does have allergies or something that might mimic uh, respiratory problems, uh, it would be good to get a note from your doctor confirming that so that we aren't um, excluding kids uh, for the wrong reasons. Uh, if the kid passes those screen, that screen, uh, we do have them come, they proceed into the gate, uh, we sanitize their hands uh, and they are instructed uh, and in, at times escorted uh, directly to their classrooms. Uh, teachers have doors open at 8.15. So like I said, 8.10 arrival time and then uh, we open the gates and let them in at 8.15. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about can kids um, walk or skateboard or ride their bikes to school? And the answer to that is yes. Um, we have the normal rules of uh, helmets and locking and registering and all those kind of things. We do uh, encourage students that as they're coming to school that they maintain distancing from one another unless they live in the same home and that they wear their facial coverings on route to school. Uh, walkers and riders are to use the east gate um, we do have folks screening folks on the east gate that's over by the kindergarten and they will present for screening. We do recommend that an adult or a, uh, a parent or a responsible adult be present for our walkers and riders. We know that that is not always the case um, and will not always be the case for our middle school students in particular. Um, if you cannot accompany your child for the screening, um, we do ask that you make sure that you have your emergency contacts updated for an adult to respond immediately. So say if a student walks to school and that student has a fever that prevents his or her access to school, uh, we would not allow them onto school grounds and we would put them in a waiting area um, just outside uh, the gate near the kinder playground and call to have that student picked up. So it's important that we have somebody that can come get them right away should they not um, pass the health screenings. Um, we have a question about what happens if my child gets sick during the school day. And so if a child develops uh, symptoms during the school day, 
um, and this would be the same for a student who passes that symptoms uh, check, is that we would have them isolated from other students. We would put a facial covering on them if they did not have one. They'd get sent home for 10 days, and then they would participate in assigned work from their teacher. And that could be something that the teacher zooms to them or provides to them in uh, packet form. Uh, teachers are available late in the afternoon. We'll get into the schedule in a little bit to meet with students that aren't able to come to school that day that are, that are sick or absent. Um, had a question, how will dismissal work? So well, we just talked about kind of how you show up for school. Uh, the dismissal, dismissal procedures is we have a 105 dismissal time uh, for middle school students. Um, they are picked up depending on their age or grade. Uh, in the front of the school are sixth graders and half of our seventh graders. So the students that are assigned to 7A will be picked up in that main pickup area in the front where we normally do it. And then our other half of seventh grade, seventh B and the eighth graders are currently scheduled to be picked up in the kinder lot. And what we do is we have them lined up um, by class so that you'll generally know where they are. And we put them six feet apart and we have that loop running through. Um, we'll give you some dashboard signs that says what class your child is in so we can better direct you and your child's name. Uh, we're currently finding with about the same number of kids, we can do our PK through one students in about 10 minutes. So we expect middle school will take approximately the same amount of time. Uh, if you're walking home, walkers exit is normal. They follow the safe school route, which is um, out the east gate, um, straight ahead to the sidewalk that is adjacent to the road. Um, we keep them out of the main parking lot and parking areas. And just like on their way to school, we do expect that they will physically distance and uh, wear facial coverings. Um, I had a question that said that I have an elementary and middle school students and the pickup time is 55 minutes apart. Is there a chance that we can extend uh, dismissal? And then there was a similar question that was talking about um, the uh, pickup lines taking up to 25 minutes, and I do not expect that that will be the case, um, and what time they'd be able to eat. So let me kind of address that elementary because it is a challenge, and it's a real big challenge for folks, uh, especially that are commuting to get to school. Um, we do have plans to have our elementary students stay at school longer, but just not immediately. Um, the elementary model is different than the middle, and that's the reason why we have these this, this uh, gap, uh, approximately an hour gap between the two dismissals. Um, the elementary model has the teachers teaching both uh, the AM in-class learners and the PM virtual learners. And so what that gives them is about three plus hours with their on-campus learners and about two hours with their uh, virtual learners. And we looked at schedule models that could potentially push that similar to the middle school model but what that would do is that would take our virtual learners in elementary and really only give them an hour of their instruction with their teacher. And so once health conditions improve and we start moving to a more full in, uh, instructional model, we do expect that those dismissals to be aligned. Um, but right now we do have our elementary being dismissed anywhere from uh, 12.05 to 12.10, depending on their age and our middle school students uh, dismissed at 105. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is, is our distancing efforts. A lot of those um, drop off and pick up procedures are designed where they are. Um, for those of you who have younger students, some are in front of the school, some are down the playground. They're designed where they are so that we can promote distancing between kids. And when we started looking at promoting distancing, we looked at it both in and out of the classroom. And we looked at some options. And for those of you who are part of these sessions before, you know, we were looking at options to include uh, a blended learning model, meaning having students on campus for so many days a week or having students on campus for a morning and an afternoon. And what we were getting from that is the ability to reduce our class sizes, um, but some very disruptive uh, programmatic um, <laughs> options. Uh, we found that we were looking at on those AM PM models to having students that were only here for about two instructional hours a day, 
when we took into account the on and off campus transitions and the cleaning. And when we looked at our two day a week model, we were looking at having kids two days a week and still not being here fully um, for some of the concerns as far as distancing during breaks. And so those models didn't work real well. And so we were shooting for, and we did, um, uh, looked for a reduced enrollment. And we did that by not accepting new interdistrict transfers. So we're down about 10% of our uh, in, interdistrict transfers. Um, and we're predicting about 10% of our students are gonna choose virtual learning. So we are getting our class sizes down. In middle school, we're looking at setting class capacity within a room uh, of 23 students. And depending on how many students choose distance learning and how many don't, uh, we believe that we're gonna be able to make that in most circumstances. Um, we are mitigating all of our rooms uh, with barriers. Um, we took out larger tables, we put in smaller desks, and we're putting in barriers between students that are not six feet apart. So in the classroom, you're going to have some students that are closer than six feet with physical barriers placed between them. Um, the other mitigation efforts we're taking, and we talked about this before, is keeping students within a class cohort. And that means that the students that are in that homeroom class will be the only students that they'll interact with. So they will stay with that student, uh, with those students in that same room um, throughout the day. They will get a, a break. Um, there'll be a 15 minute break in the morning like they normally get for nutritional break. Uh, they will stay with their same cohort in designated areas. Um, and depending on how many students choose on campus learning, we may have some overflow areas. So if we have any classes that uh, have more than 23 students, we will have overflow areas so that we do not have more than 23 students in a room at a time. Um, if we do have new students that enroll, uh, they are likely to be placed in distance learning if we can't accommodate those uh, class sizes. So if we have new students or students that are re-enrolling in the district, most likely they will be placed in the distance learning program if we don't have that space. And uh, yeah, that's that piece. Um, there is a question, why can't we stay for lunch? Like why can't the kids stay for lunch? And really one of the reasons was the health concerns and our inability to keep uh, middle school students cohorted. Um, some of the schools that opened up early, you may have heard some of the uh, Catholic high schools opened up really early in this process and they had some uh, early outbreaks and they traced that back to their lunch breaks. And they did a fairly good job of their distancing in class and their cohorting and their sanitizing and those kind of efforts. What happened was when a large group of middle schoolers got out for lunch, uh, they mingled together and they had some issues. Um, the other issue for this is that when we started looking at middle school and we saw that we're anticipating only about 10% of our middle school students that are choosing distance learning, we were able to devise a schedule that in essence uh, only has one instructional hour per day um, that is a uh, distance. And what I mean by that is a normal day would take us from 8.30 until three o'clock. Um, on this schedule that we have, we start at 8.30 and we're dismissed at 105. Um, we take that 105 to two o'clock and that becomes the student's lunch. And then two to three is their distance learning. Um, that distance learning piece is um, uh, essentially gonna be asynchronous things like PE, your IXL, your reading, um, those types of things will be assigned during that asynchronous time. Um, there was some questions from some parents that was like, okay, well, why did we have to change the schedule in order to bring folks back to school? And one of the challenges that we ran into was when we started looking at cohorting, we were looking at cohorting, not only from keeping the same students together, but limiting the number of adults. Um, one of the challenges that our teachers expressed is that some of our teachers who see all middle school students will be exposed or would have been exposed on our old schedule to over 150 students if all our students uh, chose to come back. Um, that being said, not only does that put the teacher in ri at risk, but it also takes if that teacher gets exposed and then they're exposed to another 150 students, then all our students are exposed. So there was a, a health concern about students moving between multiple teachers and the risk that that would pose not only to health, but to the instructional program. Um, depending on who an infected person has contact with and for how long, um, 
there are some quarantine requirements that the health department would direct us to do. And uh, the new model that we have right now takes classes and not only cohorts them together, but cohorts them with a teacher team of two teachers. So what we've done is your child can expect to have the, uh, in almost all cases, have the same language arts teacher that they had, um, uh, that they have right now in the virtual learning model, um, but their science and math teachers may change. And so essentially, we'll get to this in just a moment, they'll be cohorted in a, a team of teachers, one that's gonna teach their language arts and humanities, and the other one that's gonna teach their math and science. And so once we started changing some of those schedules around and some of those teaching assignments around, and we started looking at getting to the tail end of the third, uh, the first trimester, um, we're about, or we will be when we were scheduled to return on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, we'll be about 10 to 11 weeks into the trimester um, with only, with less than three weeks to return. And so since we were changing that model, that was the reason that we delayed the start so that we started in the new model and they finish out in the current one. Um, so that kind of explains that piece of it. Um, we had a, we talked about the screening and the distancing. Um, I want to talk about the masking, um, face masks. When all this started, the face mask issue was very contentious and uh, it's become a little less so now that people are learning more things about it and it's become more ubiquitous. Um, there are, um, uh, facial coverings required um, for all of our middle school students. Um, so students will be expected to arrive with um, a facial covering, a cloth facial covering. Uh, they do need to wear it um, for the majority of the day. There are some exceptions. Um, make sure it is a cloth facial covering and that it is not a um, one that has a valve in it. The valve ones are not permitted. Um, so none of the ones with the valves. Um, if students, and this is per the order from the state, if students do refuse to wear facial coverings at school, they're to be placed on distance learning. So it's one of those things that we don't have the ability to negotiate that, um, especially with our middle school students. Um, but we do have some times when they can take it off. Um, when they're uh, six feet and they're outside uh, during physical exertion, they can remove their uh, facial coverings. Uh, teachers are building in outdoor learning time for students in which they can take mass breaks. And when they are eating and uh, drinking, uh, we also allow them to take their face masks off. Um, speaking of eating and drinking, uh, we do have our water fountains closed for safety reasons. So we do encourage students to bring refillable water bottles uh, to school. And then we are currently not serving snack out of our kitchen. Um, so as we'll get into the schedule in a little bit, you realize that the kids are here for a pretty long time. So we do encourage you to uh, pack uh, snacks for your students um, because there will not be snacks served in the kitchen, uh, at least not yet. Um, the fourth thing I wanted to get into before we get into the academic program is the sanitation efforts. Um, we have increased our sanitation efforts to make our campus cleaner. We purchased some additional equipment. Uh, we purchased this uh, machine called the Lotus Pro which creates, uh, converts water into what's called aqueous ozone. And it's sprayed and can kill um, viruses, including coronavirus within a minute. The nice thing about it is it does retain um, properties of water. So it is safe enough to use around kids and throughout the day. So all of our classrooms are outfitted um, with the um, aqueous ozone from the Lotus Pro that teachers and students can use throughout the day. And then we also purchased three electrostatic sprayers. So those are the things you see kind of foaming things off that look like kind of Ghostbuster type stuff. Um, and we use those on a daily basis to all rooms that have students in them. So each room is sanitized uh, daily uh, with the electrostatic sprayers. And we have hired additional custodial staff to do that. Um, we realized that our maintenance and custodial crew can't do this extra stuff um, on their own. So we did hire and additional staff for that. And you will hear and see us encouraging students to wash and sanitize their hands all day long when they come in campus, when they uh, enter a room, when they leave a room, after they go outside, before they eat, after they cough or sneeze, pretty much every opportunity we get. So every classroom uh, and many common areas are outfitted with hand sanitizer as well. And we are encouraging <clears throat> uh, teachers to increase ventilation so we're encouraging open doors. Um, as I said, outdoor learning and teaching uh, environments. 
We have purchased some temporary shade structures and we're looking into some permanent ones as well. Um, we've replaced filters in all our buildings uh, with the highest rating of a uh, MERV 13. And we are, like I said, working with teachers to develop some more opportunities for kids to learn outside, um, whether those are overflow groups or regular opportunities for kids to be outside. So when your kids do come back to school, we would encourage you to send them with hats and sunscreen and that water that I mentioned. Um, those are the things that I see so far on the uh, health stuff. And I'll get into next the um, academic program option. So there's really two options for middle school students. One of them is to come to class and we'll go over that schedule in just a moment. Uh, the other is to uh, be placed on distance learning. Um, but the distance learning is very different than what we're doing now. So I wanna make sure people understand what those, what those two options look like. Um, like I said, the changes in schedules have resulted in uh, some changes to teaching assignments. Um, most of the kids will be with similar teachers. Um, there will be some change ups in science and math assignments. Um, uh, like I said, the reason we delayed this is we were so far in, we're past the three quarter mark of this trimester that we're finishing in the current, current model. Um, the in-class option for kids that come uh, unlike the elementary, it is five days a week instead of four days a week, and it runs from 8.30 until 1.05. So as I mentioned, the only asynchronous, non-teacher-led um, uh, instruction is that last hour, which is two to three, and teachers are available during those times for office hours, um, three, days, three days a week, um, or to meet with distance learners who have subject-specific questions. Uh, the school day is broken up into a four period day. Um, kids stay in the same cohort. As I mentioned, two teachers will lead that cohort, um, capped at 23, uh, and they dismissed for lunch at home. So there are options to pick up grab and go lunch and grab and go breakfast. Um, they do need to be reheated. Um, so students that are receiving free and reduced lunch certainly can grab their free and reduced lunch. Students who want to purchase it still can. Um, those are um, provided at the east lot. There's a little, I mean, the west lot over by the preschool. There's a tent over there for you. Um, distance learners, they're assigned to a distance learning specialist. Um, that'll be Mrs. English. We may add additional people depending on how many people choose distance learning. Uh, it will be a mostly an independent study program through uh, Edgenuity. If you have any students at the high school, you may be familiar with the Edgenuity program. Uh, there will be daily interactions with the distance learning cohort um, uh, each day. You'll have daily interactions with the distance learning cohort. Um, and the students that are choosing distance learning uh, are expected to remain in that for the school year. Um, we will reevaluate on parent teacher requests, but we'll probably look to do that uh, at the end of the trimester, which is the end of February. Um, one of the reasons we do expect students to stay in the Edgenuity program is it doesn't directly parallel the instruction of the class. Um, but we did get questions, can students return? And the answer is, is yes, but we do evaluate that on um, whether we have space in that room and whether it makes sense academically. Um, question, why are you taking so long to get our kids back to school? Uh, why didn't everybody return at once? And the short answer is we could have returned everybody at once. Um, when the governor lessened restrictions, they said you have to follow the guidelines of the California Department of Public Health. Um, so the short answer is we could, the long answer is it probably wasn't what's best for our students and our staff. Um, if you've been paying attention to the news, you've seen that some school districts have chosen uh, to return all their kids at once and they've run into some problems with it. Um, Sometimes those issues are unrelated to school. They just happen to have something from the outside and exposed. And sometimes they're related to um, not following proper protocols. Um, our return to school plan uh, basically has a delayed, slow, staggered start, as I mentioned before. And really what that's all designed to do is to mitigate our drop off and our pickups and work on our breaks and our transitions and our outdoor spaces, our classroom mitigations, our cleaning protocols to make sure that we're doing it right. And like I said, we led into with kids that had the highest need or students with disabilities first and working our way through. But that's the reason why 
we had taken this approach to coming in slower um, to both meet those needs and to keep people safe. Um, the schools that are experiencing problems are going in the opposite direction and they bring students back and then they have to move them back onto a, a distance or a virtual learning and it tends to be pretty disrupt disruptive. Um, question on uh, when do I have to decide whether I'm going to do uh, distance or in class? Um, most have submitted their preference and if that's still your preference, you don't have to do anything. We've, we've got that on record. Um, if you change your mind or you haven't, uh, let your homeroom teacher know um, by the end of the week. And that way we'll update that. If we don't hear from you, we will reach out to you, but let us know. Um, we had a question as to why didn't we do the same model as the elementary? So the elementary model, if you're familiar with it, um, has the same teacher teaching in the morning and they teach their virtual learners in the afternoon. Um, one of the challenges that we ran into is we have far fewer uh, middle schoolers that are expressing an interest in that and we have multiple periods to teach. And so that model did not work very well for the, for the middle school. Um, and because we we're able to get a middle school model that was robust enough to have um, only an hour a day of non-instructional time, um, it seemed like that was the one that made the most sense, especially since our middle schoolers are more capable of an independent study program. So we look at our elementary students and our kindergartners do not do very well on independent study. So that was one of the reasons we looked at that. Um, we have, I, we've had multiple questions that are on a similar theme. So I'll try to answer it. And if we don't get to the details of it, um, please put it in the chat and we can address it there. Um, the question uh, re revolves around Zoom. <clears throat> and the questions are various uh, kind of variations of um, why can't teachers just Zoom to the distance learners? Or why not put a camera in the classroom and have teachers teach both students at the same time? Um, that way they'll be on the same page. Um, one of, there's a, a few answers to that. One is we had discussed that when we were in uh, negotiations with our teacher leaders, and it wasn't something that um, we came to an agreement upon. Um, we worked with our teacher leaders uh, to come up with plans to return. And the dual zooming was one thing that we were not able to come into agreement on. Um, what we are doing now though, is some of our elementary students, uh, elementary teachers are piloting that to see the viability for it. So it could be an option. Um, and we still have a little time before middle school starts. So it could be an option. It's something we're still discussing. Um, uh, uh, the, Dual Zooming does provide some benefits. You do get inclusion and connection. Um, there are some challenges that the teachers are having with logistics of teaching students in front of them and teaching students at home. So we are trying to work through that, but that is not part of the current plan that we have. Um, there was a question about, um, since we aren't teaching science every day, um, can we just Zoom that instead? Um, uh, the middle school schedule does have us teaching science each day. Um, so there will be science taught live each day. We did have some questions about what subjects, um, if we had to do some subjects that were distance learning, which ones made more sense. And we were looking at science being a real challenge to do uh, from a distance learning model because um, when we teach science, we do a lot of hands-on stuff. Um, there was a question about, um, the Edgenuity platform and saying, is it a supplement? And if it's a supplement, why are we using it um, for our primary curriculum? And what I can say to that is it is not um, uh, a supplemental program. Uh, it is a standalone program. Uh, it's used by a lot of districts. Um, it does appear to be from what we can gather the uh, most popular choice of distance learning programs uh, currently used by the high school. Um, the courses can be combined or separated. So where it probably looks like a supplement is we may be still using it as our uh, way to deliver our history content, um, but it's uh, different courses that can be assigned. And so for our distance learners, they would have the full complement of those courses, um, but it does include the instruction and the assessment and support within it. Um, so yeah, that, that would be that. We have a question that says, um, will uh, distance learners be able to ask physical teachers for help? And the answer to this is yes. Um, so you will have 
subject specific teachers that will be available to our distance learners uh, during their office hours. And that will be that last hour of the day, um, uh, three days a week. Um, and then Mrs. English, possibly more teachers, depending on how many people choose distance learning, will be the distance specialist to support students and to meet with them daily for any questions about logistics on the program or content. So you will have uh, them meeting with physical teachers on a daily basis. Uh, what would happen if the online schooling doesn't work out second or third week, will students still be able to switch? And so kind of getting back to that, we are looking at having students that stay for uh, the trimester. Um, the Edgenuity program does not align directly with the uh, uh, pacing of in classes. So we are looking for students to stay in that program, but we would consider it on a case by case basis. And our goal uh, is eventually get all our students back to campus. So if we can do that in a safe way that provides some continuity of students learning, um, that is our goal is to try to get kids back. Um, there was a question as to why we chose Edgenuity. Um, and there was talking about some negative reviews online. And I can tell you that Edgenuity does have um, uh, some mixed reviews. Uh, some of them are negative. Uh, some of them are, are positive. Um, it's often criticized as with almost all online learning programs for being boring and having too much work and not being as engaging as a teacher would be. And I would say that that is true for just about any online computer program that you do. Um, there are some positive reports that come in there about how it is uh, standards aligned to what kids need to learn. Uh, and it gives them the ability to accelerate their learning um, and get remediation and individualization. So it does have both of those, those aspects to it. Um, the bottom line is, is it works for some kids. Um, it's not ideal for all kids. Um, kids who work more independently, kids who are seeking additional challenges, um, we did have some kids with our independent learning program last year, some of the same complaints and legitimately so that some parts were, were kind of boring. Um, we're able to accelerate. Um, some of our eighth graders took high school courses and were able to advance that way. So it does have some benefits, um, but I would say that all of the online programs have some similar detriment uh, in that they are not as engaging as some others. So we were looking at a program that has been tested uh, before. Um, we've used it. Uh, like I said, the high school has used it in the past um, and it does provide the, uh, the content we're looking for. Um, there's a question on the daily schedule and for middle schoolers, what's the daily schedule and is it gonna change? Um, the second part of that's easier. Yes, <laughs> at some point it will change. Um, we expect to be in this for a while, um, but we wanna go to full day. Um, when we're able to. And so we do expect this to change um, into another model um, once we're able to keep kids on campus longer. But the short part answer to that schedule is um, uh, drop off at 810, gates open at 815. Um, students will have a daily homeroom from 830 to 850. Um, within that same group of kids, they have the daily homeroom. They'll have the first of, uh, or the first two blocks um, it's either going to be language arts and humanities or math and science. Um, each of those blocks lasts for 60 minutes. So that block goes for two hours. Um, they do get a cohorted break. So we give them 15 minute break. Um, we keep them together. Like I said, they don't mix with other groups of students. Uh, and then they return for another uh, set of two hour blocks um, between 1105 and 105. And that's with the opposite. So if they had Math and science for the first block, they're with their ELA and humanities teacher. And then students are dismissed at 105. And like I said, our pickup is going to be in the front of the school, either the main lot or the uh, east lot over by the kinder lot, um, depending on the class your student is in. Um, the distance learners, we will have a daily meeting. We haven't established the distance learning schedules yet. It's going to depend on how many kids choose distance learning. Like I said, it's mostly independent study. So it's not as time contingent, but they do have access to their distance learning teacher and then their subject specific teachers um, in the afternoon. Uh, we mentioned uh, lunch and nutrition. Um, breakfast and lunch uh, can be taken to go, bring snacks to school. Um, all students who receive free and reduced lunch should expect to continue to do so. Um, we had a question about supplies. Uh, what supplies 
will my child need to bring and do they need to bring their Chromebook? And so when we look at supplies, the answer to that will be, um, your teacher will let you know um, what your on-campus supplies will need to be once we get a little bit closer to our return date. And if you checked out a uh, Chromebook, you can keep that. Um, no matter what program you choose, there will still be um, uh, home learning, um, either for the folks who come to school, will have some home learning things assigned and obviously distance learners will need it. Um, so we do have enough computers for you to keep those and still have access to that. Uh, we have a question as to when will we know the assigned teachers are math teachers trained to teach science? And so we have teachers in our middle, I'll answer the first one. Uh, you'll know what your assigned teachers are. We expect to have those schedules out um, before students leave for Thanksgiving break. Um, the only challenge we're running into now is uh, systemically um, putting the new classes in while we haven't assigned the grades for the old classes. So we're looking to give you a notification, but I can tell you the way the schedules are shaping up with very little um, uh, change. Uh, you're most likely going to see um, all your language arts teachers or near, nearly all your language arts humanities teachers stay the same. And then, like I said, those changes are gonna be in the math and science. And so when it comes down to, are they trained to teach uh, math and science? Um, those teachers in our middle school have multiple subject credentials or multiple, uh, they're multiply credentialed. Um, we are allotting our math and science teachers to team together. We're giving them some additional preparation time so that the math teachers can support our science teacher and the science teacher can support the math. So we will have some collaborative teaching that goes on. So that's how we are running that uh, cohort. Um, next question says, if San Diego County moves into the purple tier before November 30th, will we proceed with this plan? Uh, the answer is most likely yes, as long as it still seems advisable to do so. And so what I mean by that is we have been teetering on the border between the, um, the red tier and the purple tier. Uh, if we moved into the purple tier prior to November 30th, it um, would not require schools to change anything. Um, the purple tier is designed as one that if schools had not reopened at all, uh, there'd be restrictions on their reopening. Um, schools that have opened following the guidance of uh, public health are permitted to remain open. So we would continue to monitor the conditions in the area. The challenge that we have um, with county health tier system is, is a countywide thing. And so we'd be looking a little bit closer as to what our metrics are locally. But the plan is, is if we moved into the purple tier and it was still believed that our uh, safety mitigation, mitigations were adequate, we would still continue with the November 30th plan. Um, there are some things that would trigger us to change. And a lot of that has to do with uh, direct implications in our community or direct implications to our school. Um, I think I mentioned earlier, um, not, actually, I'm, I don't think I did. Um, we've been, we've had kids back at school for about two months and I'm happy to say we have no um, students or staff uh, since we've returned students to campus um, that have tested positive. Um, we do have a um, COVID uh, dashboard on our website. And what that does is it makes sure that if we have any positive cases, you would know it. And if there are positive cases that affect students, meaning uh, students that are considered to have close contact, uh, you would know it through the contact tracing uh, and it would put certain students into a quarantine status. Um, but yeah, the move to the purple tier uh, would not be an indicator for us to not uh, move forward with the plan unless there were some other extenuating circumstances. Um, there was a question about, uh, you stated that students choose distance learning. Uh, we'll have to stay on distance learning for the year, but for those who may be put on a wait list due to classroom space, uh, how would the curriculum be bridged if edgenuity does not align when they make it to campus? Let me see if I can understand that question a little bit better. Okay, so really what we're looking at is um, we do have some concerns and we're gonna look at edgenuity um, with our distance learning specialist to see if we can reframe the order of the lessons to try to make it align, but we know it's not gonna be perfect. And so if students are on the wait list, 
there's probably going to be some tutorials or some gap pieces that are gonna be more about order than they are about um, curriculum. Meaning if they teach fractions before they do percents, they may have to do some, some mitigation on that kind of stuff. And so there will be some concerns about the students that are on the wait list. Um, uh, if they do come back in, um, doesn't mean necessarily that they're gonna have to stay on distance learning for the year. Um, the main decision on whether they can return is going to be um, whether we can uh, have enough uh, physical distancing in the class. The secondary piece is how do we address the academic stuff, but that would not be the sole reason that we would not return a student. Um, is this a push towards waiting until 2021 to return as we only have a couple of weeks before our winter break upon the new return date? I can say no, it is not. Um, this was something that's much more stemmed from a natural break. Um, one of the recommendations we had on our um, uh, safe return to school task force was to try to align our returns uh, to natural academic breaks. So no, my, um, my push has been trying to get kids here um, for a long time. So this is not a uh, anything designed with any intent to delay it beyond the 30th. It's kind of when the, the natural break occurs. Um, so no, that is not what our desire is as far as pushing that. Um, looking in the room for ch any additional chat questions. Yeah, so we're looking at it being the, the trimester date. So the return is when the first day of the second trimester is November 30th. And so no, it's not, not looking to delay it longer than that. Um, I don't see anything else in the chat at the moment. Um, I know I've been talking a lot. So uh, is there anybody who has any other questions? Uh, you guys have the ability to unmute if you would like, or if you wanna put any other questions in the chat. I know it's a lot of information and there will be some that is likely to change between now and then as we solidify some of these plans. Um, but in summary, what we feel really good about on this program is that we do have the ability to um, bring back all middle school students who are comfortable and ready to come back. Um, we have the ability to do it in a way that we can have kids on campus five days a week um, for nearly a full instructional day. Like I said, we're giving up that one hour at the end of the day, um, which will do some asynchronous stuff. But really, when you throw in some PE and some silent reading and some IXL, um, those are some things that can be done without the, the teacher leading it. Um, so we're looking at a program that we feel really good about. Um, we'll continue to keep an eye on, on health conditions. Um, we wanna make sure that this program meets academic needs, but doesn't do so in a, in a reckless way. Um, and we feel like we've got a, a good spot. Um, I know the biggest complaints that we had from some parents is um, our teachers have done a real good job um, working hard to provide a, a distance learning program. And as we get a small number of students that are choosing the, the distance learning, it makes it harder to provide that type of program. So when all our teachers are committed to, to full day instruction um, and we have a, a small group, right now we're looking at about 18 students um, that have selected their uh, distance learning program. That's when we start putting that into more of an independent study type program with some daily supports. And so that's kind of what we're looking at there. Um, I know there are some concerns about that bifurcated pickup time um, between elementary and middle. And we really did not want to cut our middle school students academic day short just to accommodate a, a release time that aligns with elementary. So I, I do know that creates a burden on some of our um, families. And I'm optimistic that we can start getting our elementary to stay longer as health conditions improve. And we'll probably see a similar path when that happens. Meaning as we get to a point where we start seeing students, um, less students choosing or wanting virtual learning and more students that we can bring on campus in a safe way, we'll probably look at our elementary as to having a, a distance learning person assigned to them as well. So uh, when we get to that point, we'll very likely see um, the ability to have those release times align a little bit better. Um, question here says, are there uh, special needs middle school students on campus at this time? And I'm so glad you mentioned that because there's a piece of this that I forgot to mention to you. Um, one of the things that we're looking at is, yes, we do have our, uh, many of our special needs um, students, both our language learners and our students with uh, disabilities 
that are on campus now, and they've been so um, since early part of September, and they are in cohorted groups back on campus. Um, we are looking at, um, and we've heard from a lot of you, that there are students that are not doing well uh, academically. We have some students that are failing or at risk of failure that are not labeled with a disability or are not labeled as an English learner. They're just really struggling with their distance learning. And so we're putting together uh, groups of students um, that are at risk for failure to invite them back to campus earlier. And what we're looking at is starting as early as uh, Tuesday of next week, uh, November 2nd, we're looking at using the teacher's office hours. So those afternoon times that teachers do office hours and having um, some of our high need students that are not designated, that have not been back to campus, um, back on campus to get supports. Because um, like I said, we will be down in the last few weeks of the trimester and we want students to be successful. And as we bridge this time between the end of this term and coming back to a new, new term where you're going to have schedules change, uh, distance learning options change. Um, we'd like these kids to be successful, especially our eighth graders. Um, we wanna make sure that they're successful and prepared for high school. This is the chance that we will, um, last chance we get. Um, what will determine or define high need students? Um, what we're looking at right now is we looked at students on our eligibility list. And typically what our eligibility list looks at is students that have failed any class or that have two or more Ds. And so we're looking at those students as being the most in need um, because they're academically unsuccessful. And so that's our starting point. And we're kind of weaning out, are these students getting supports in any other ways? And if, if not, those are the students that we're looking at. So um, I know Mrs. Lee has been working with the teachers and compiling some lists. Uh, Mrs. Lee, do you have any update on kind of how we're gonna be communicating those? I'm sorry, I was answering private questions. Can you reword the question? Yeah, yeah, we were talking about the small groups of students that we plan on bringing back to campus next week um, for additional okay. support. And Absolutely. how are we gonna be communicating that out? And if um, parents feel that their, need, that their kids uh, need those supports, how would they reach out to, to request? All right, thank you for that. Um, I know that the middle school team was finalizing their list based on student need. So it's a lot of students that they had parent conferences with, students that are struggling based on the progress reports. So um, they're, they're very close to finalizing that list and that communication will come um, from the teachers very soon because it's expected to start next week. We need to find out a couple of things first. Yeah, and, and that stemmed from a lot that we heard from, from uh, many of you who said that this distance learning is not working for my child. I want my child back on campus. They really need um, some in-person supports. And so when we got to this point where we saw that we had this de delay um, based on our schedule change, it still didn't change the fact that there were needs there. And so that was the reason that we're looking at bringing those kids, getting them support during the office hours um, so that we can have some um, more success and a better momentum moving into the into the second trimester. So I think we got to the chat pieces. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question like the good old fashioned way or uh, have any questions that we didn't answer? All right, the Zoom silence is deafening. So um, if you do have some questions that you want to raise, um, Feel free to reach out to me or Mrs. Lee. Um, like I said, I know this is is disappointing. It's it's disappointing to me. It's disappointing to the teachers that are eager to have students back. Um, like I said, though, the uh, plan that we have in place is very robust and um, provides a lot more opportunities for your students with on-campus learning um, than any of the programs that we've seen so far. And what I mean by that is um, many of our neighboring districts had larger class sizes and were unable to get to a reasonable number to bring back students who wanted to come back without doing so in a um, really messy way. Like I said, a very limited number of days per week, very limited uh, AM, PM schedules, which um, talking to many of you uh, was gonna wreak some havoc. And so hopefully this program will be something that'll be a benefit and something that we can build some, some momentum on. Um, 
this has been a long, long time coming. And uh, we are super eager to have your kids back on campus. Um, I can tell you from the return of our elementary students, uh, not only have we had a safe return, um, but the kids have brought some life back to, to the campus. Um, their learning opportunities are better when they're here. Um, it's been exhausting on many of our teachers. Um, they're working really hard, um, but they're super eager to have you guys back. And so we're looking at um, having you guys uh, come join us. Like I said, we'll uh, look to open the doors on the 30th, the first day of the trimester. Um, we'll be reaching out to some of you if your kids are struggling. Uh, if you see it, um, reach out to us and we'll see what we can do in the meantime. Uh, but thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, we'll, like I said, put this on um, YouTube. If you have any private questions, feel free to email. Um, we'd be happy to answer those for you. And then I will continue to keep you updated. Um, the only thing that we know about this is that things change as it goes along. Um, like I said, unless there's some significant changes, I don't see any changes in our return date on the 30th. Um, but I'll keep you apprised if there's some, some changes on the, on the margins or if there's anything else that you need to know. But thank you very much. It is good to see you all. Uh, be safe, stay well, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, bye.